Our last speaker is William Costa from the Universidade Presbiteriana Mackenzie from Brazil. And he will talk to us about shaping data for assessing biodiversity climate shifts. So William, it's all yours. Hi Paula, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I will try to share my screen in a moment. Could you see that? Yes, you see it. I'm working with two um, to present to two monitors and they are uh, a little problem, but I, I guess I guess I can can start. Um, uh, thank you, thank you for for attention. Um, um, my name is is William, as as Paula said, and I'm, I'm a professor. Uh, a professor in the Mackenzie Presbyterian University, yeah. Universidade Presbyteriana Mackenzie, and I will I will uh, present to you one of uh, those of uh, your results, or your uh, uh, especially um, specifically my um, postdoc results in that. Uh, I worked with with Chris Giannini, Teresa Cristina Giannini, and Antonio Saliva. Um, Teresa Cristina uh, is a uh, um, staff of uh, Valley um, Valley uh, Institute of of uh, um, Preservation, and Saliva is a, a professor of the University of São Paulo. Um, okay. Um, ecosystem services provided by biodiversity are associated with support life on the planet. Um, has as you you know. Uh, climate change was uh, was negatively impacted by biodiversity and altering the phenology and geographical distribution of species and the interaction between them. Between them. Uh, in in your know, study, uh, we selected one. One area in the Carajás uh, forest, and uh, this this area is located inside the uh, state of Pará, uh, that is part of Amazon Beyond. This this area is is a megadiverse area, and when I try to to study this this kind of uh, uh, region, we have a lot of problems, um, mainly because it's a really huge uh, place, and and we we need a lot of efforts. We need a lot of spe specialists, and um, sometimes it's it's not uh, the the study is not feasible. Uh, to to uh, establish uh, the entire uh, interaction between uh, different different species. Um, so uh, we we use in your approach um, species distribution modeling. And we combine this species distribution with other techniques. Uh, 
uh, we put uh, the, the, the the things all things together to try uh, to uh, to to get to, to obtain a, a approach for for the species interaction uh, for example um, pollination syndrome and when when I obtain this special distribution and we can we can uh, we can visualize the special special patterns and the dynamics of these uh, populations. In in our study, we uh, we opt, we uh, use it. Uh, uh, six six hundred eight uh, species within in eight syndromes, and two scenarios divide of greenhouse emissions where where uh, we use uh, these scenarios for two thousand fifty and two thousand seventy in your projections, and as uh, we we uh, try to model to to create this this model in interactions uh, networks. We generated this this representation model um, of process that that I'm uh, that I'll show you, uh, that I show to you in the, the final presentation. And this this slide I I show to you uh, how how uh, what is mean this these areas that I'm I'm trying to describe uh, to describe um, as you can see we have in these maps uh, the this first one is the current distribution of uh, one species and then uh, or, or, or your uh, your projections we can see that there is a, a huge uh, decrease in the, the suitable regions for that species uh, can live. Then the main objective of this, this, uh, this kind of study is to establish uh, how, how the, the species can survive in the climate change uh, future scenarios. So uh, we ident identify areas that uh, can be more more uh, suitable for 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 this um, this species in future. Um, one problem is uh, eventually some of these areas are too uh, degraded, and then. Uh, Maybe some of the, the species cannot uh, will survive in in future. As uh, your, our uh, results, we identified the problem losses of um, in the first study that that I that I we uh, finished. Uh, we try to see what 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 can can happen with uh, bats in uh, especially the 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 pollinators one and you know, we we obtained the results that uh, um, in order of sixty six percent of the the nectarivor nectarivor uh, batch species will be impacted for um, the, the the shift in the the area that the these species can live. Uh, also, my colleague Leonardo Miranda uh, obtaining the the results that uh, approximately approximately uh, sixty percent of uh, these these nectarivorous birds uh, cannot cannot will survive in this 
uh, in this area. And for bees, uh, the, the impact is more, um, is more strong because each 5% is not uh, possible to live in this same area that uh, the, 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 the species live today. <clears throat> the okay hello are you listening okay uh, so uh, in this this projections um, we we obtained the uh, a drastic, drastic reduction in, uh, in species richness especially in the central uh, certain of portion of the stage where uh, Carajás uh, is located. Um, and it's just uh, freezing. Or some morning. Okay, uh, and this this all things uh, from from this all uh, kind of models that we obtaining, we we observed. Uh, I observed uh, one one pattern of uh, the 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 interaction between your group and then i i try to to model the entire process that we use to uh, obtain this this uh, these models uh, and this uh, image uh, this image that that you are seeing is the result of uh, your uh, data processing flow um, in the in the first part, we we we've validated the, the species data that is provided by the the, the group of biologists working with us, and then uh, we generate the the SDM models in scenario in scenarios based on this data, and for some some uh, species. Uh, simply is not possible to obtain these STM models because uh, or the species is too generalist and then uh, they can fit in every place and so we, we cannot uh, obtain a, a, a special distribution uh, uh, or uh, we can uh, generate uh, these models in, in this case we try to validate the, the model quality and we reject this, this model if the, the, the resulting model is not fit in your quality criteria. Uh, when when we, we cannot model the species, uh, we'll try another, uh, another kind of um, models or Kind of approaches to uh, to obtain an um, alternative map or a map using another model, uh, uh, especially with with uh, using species that have uh, just a few points that you cannot use um, the the classical uh, approaches and. Sometimes we have success and sometimes not. And, and then the, the flux of processing continue and uh, for, for, the, for the final uh, results, we estimate the climate, climate shifts, climate, climate shifts from future scenarios for each uh, species. And then <clears throat> we combine this, uh, this information in a ensemble, and then we generate the, the lists 
the, the list and the, the maps to be aggregated and uh, ana analyze it to obtain the interaction interactions between these species. <clears throat> um, and uh, as uh, results of, of our uh, work, we will try to publish the entire data sets that we generated in the last uh, three years with all the, those results. Um, especially because uh, our data set is, is really huge. Is they, they just not uh, have only the state of Para, but, but they have the entire country. And I guess uh, this kind of data can can be used for 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 future uh, research. This is all that, that I, I I want to that I have to present you today, and this is mainly my effort to show uh, for the community uh, what 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 can do and how how it can work. Uh, in uh, in your process to generate these models and maybe uh, that the 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 Darwin core or some uh, other metadata metadata can can have some kind of of representation of process or some some way to representation. Of process in the in the meta metadata for these species and models is is uh, that is it. Uh, thank you for for listening. Sorry, uh, my, my my bad pronunciation, but I hope you uh, understood my my points my point uh, today. Thank you. Thank you very much, William. I think we could all understand you just fine. No problem with the, with the language there. Um, so we have uh, time for a couple, maybe short couple of questions for you and then we will pass to the discussion uh, part of our session. So the question that I see here is says, have you tried or tested joint species distribution models to detect interspecific interactions? Um, okay, uh, we, we just uh, don't try it in the, this time, but can, can be, uh, I can do in the future, but in this, uh, this time we just uh, generated the, the map for each species uh, individually and then we try to to uh, put all of this um, this maps generated together and uh, uh, knowing the the some 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 relations or some interaction between them we can we we try to infer another uh, another relation relationships and I guess is 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 not the this this is not answer the entire question. There are a lot of doubts about this this kind of uh, approach. But uh, uh, we ha we have uh, conscious consistent uh, results that show us what what uh, areas can be more suitable in. Uh, really in near future for these species and uh, what species maybe cannot will survive the the those, those climate changes and unf unfortunately um, our, our study is not uh, I, I'm personally my, my colleagues is optimist but I I 
I'm a computer scientist and the models are just showing me that things will be really dangerous if you continue with the same practice, practice that we are having until now, the business as usual. And especially now in Brazil, uh, I guess uh, you, you know uh, how things are, are going with uh, forests and Pantanal. And then, <laughs> is that? But um, I, I guess we'll, uh, we are uh, working with another methods and especially ones uh, related with, with um, corridors and then we can connect species uh, using these this, uh, biological corridors. And we are continuing uh, our, our, our uh, work. Thank you, William. Okay. Uh, anyone else from the uh, in the audience has other questions for William? Again, please capture your questions for all speakers, either in the chat or in the document, so that we can uh, share with everyone in this uh, minutes that we have left of the session. I don't see anyone raising their hands right now. Um, so I will add a very quick question that it kind of diverts a little from from the technical side, and that is, uh, you conducted this in national parks and national forests. How do you expect these results to be actually mainstream to policy and decision making? Um, uh, can you repeat the 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 last sentence is how? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, I'll try to rephrase. So these, these are great results that you get. How are you going to make sure these results uh, reach the people that are dealing with policy and decision making? Okay. Um, I guess uh, always, especially in this, this area, we have to, we, you need a governmental programs to do this thing because um, the, the the people in general uh, is not uh, really uh, it's not so really preoccupied with 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 uh, ecosystems or things they, they are usually just uh, thinking in how can I eat tomorrow how can I uh, have my one employ, uh, employment or how, how can I buy uh, food? And then if you don't have uh, programs to, to uh, increment and try to use the biodiversity of the local for the indigenous people or for for other, uh, uh, I, I, I guess is uh, we we don't don't we will have success in the preservation of this area. There, there are uh, other uh, other thing in this this uh, the preservation of this area. There, there is a lot of of commercial interests, uh, commercial in, uh, companies that, that are trying to explore these regions to extract things. And I don't know exactly how can we just combine this, this kind of interests because the, 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 this, this, Companies are really big. It's really huge. Have uh, a lot of um, power, and they have uh, control of of uh, 
Congress. I, I really hope that that um, in in near future the the government can uh, could uh, come back with with pro programs to uh, help the the people that, that live in this area to to uh, obtain the, the the benefits for um, for uh, biological services maybe environmental services the, the, the nature uh, and, and just uh, keep uh, keep it, uh, having an income and not try to to just uh, wipe off the the forest and 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 sell the 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 wood and and not all other situation. I I don't uh, I I don't know if I I answer uh, your question, but I guess I guess you did. It's a very complex situation. Well, it's normal in our countries that that it would be the case. But I was wondering if you were having any any particular strategy or if it was something that it was asked for or or uh, needed right away from some government agency or something. But but I, it makes perfect sense. All you said it makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah. But thank you very much, yes. William. Okay. So Thank we you. are hey. moving now to our open discussion session, part of the session. So um, I've gone through the questions and comments that we've gathered so far, and I think I could only find one, uh, one that was not actually answered or discussed either uh, here by, this, by, our, by our speakers or on the documents. I will share that with you. But in the meantime, please uh, think of questions or discussion topics that you would like to share and feel free to raise your hand and we will open the microphones uh, for you to, to participate. So the question that I found left was for Catherine and it says standardization of sampling protocols is a hugely important issue for ecology or sampling event data. And Neon decided not to use protocols, but build their own methods. What is the state of this work? And it continues to say, I know methods are standard across Neon sites, but what is the standard for methods? And can it be used outside Neon? Yes, yeah, so this is an excellent question. We have been developing our protocols in conjunction with these technical working groups that I had alluded to earlier. And so we choose protocols that uh, are very commonly used in the literature and in the field to, to do uh, collections for our target organisms. Um, for instance, there are numerous methods to collect insects um, for carabids pitfall trapping is the most commonly used. Um, so we do that. The protocols that we, uh, that we have written um, and have developed to work across, you know, in the case of uh, some of our sampling across, you know, 47 or 81 or however many of the sites um, are publicly posted and are part of the metadata that you get uh, as a download when your data package is compiled from downloading it off the portal. Um, and then your question about protocols.io, um, we're very interested in uh, sharing the protocols that we have and incorporating um, you know, updates from others. Um, and we actually have a, a number of projects where folks have taken a NEON protocol and used it in their own system um, and then are in the process of writing it up and publishing. So um, we, we are very interested in having protocols that cross 
um, our project into other projects? Great question. Thank you, Catherine. I will keep going with the questions that are gathered in the chat, but please feel free to just uh, raise your hands now and ask them yourselves if you want. Uh, I don't see any hands uh, raised so far. So the next question was for David, but David had to run. So Richard uh, Raveler is going to answer for him or so I was told. And it says, I think, uh, X Kates was mentioned at the end of the talk. Could you expand on how they could be used? I'd be glad to, since that's one of the things that I put in the talk. Uh, Exocati sets in botany are both very useful because they're widely distributed, but they're difficult to, uh, I'm going to say, exchange data on because they, there's no Darwin core place to put the information. They were sets that were devised and oftentimes sold as representative sets. They were compiled by individual editors. In many cases, there may be a hundred examples of them in some of the sets for each number. And so they're very useful in terms of the duplicate information that's, that's possible. If uh, information about one of, the, one of the examples has been already generated, it would be great to be able to share that information. And so this is, an, this is one example of data that's, it's probably out there and in the cryptogamic areas, let's say uh, bryophytes and fungi. I know that there's a way of um, recording the information, for example, in a symbiota portal. I think in the uh, Michael portal, there's 400 different Exocati sets that they've recognized, but because of the Darwin core problem, that data is not directly downloaded in a download from a symbiota portal. And it, it's useful data that is oftentimes, uh, I, I can't say ignored because those of us that know about it are very game to use it. But a lot of cases, you can't get it because it's been recorded incorrectly. That may be a very long answer, but this, this is a topic that I've been uh, very interested in and in trying to figure out a way to more correctly record the information and make it more use more widely available. Thank you, Nikki, for the question. Thanks, Richard, uh, for for your for your answer. I see Quentin, you have your hand up. Hi, yeah, I put uh, I put my question into the document as well, but um, I might as well say it out loud. It's easier to say that way. Um, so I've been working on <laughs> looking at interactions of, of invasive species in Europe, and what's been really useful is the fact that all of the there's so much interaction data available for North America. Because if we have invasive species like the raccoon coming to Europe, we know all the things interacts with because all of the North Americans have been digitizing all of that interaction data. And likewise, I Im imagine if a European species goes to North America, it's really helpful to have all of the European interaction <laughs> data as well. So, so one way to do that, uh, the, the, the question more, the point was that don't ignore the interactions you see in things like zoo collections or in botanical garden collections, because in actual fact, we can use those interactions of, of, of species that don't normally interact when those species are put into a different location and, and uh, become naturalized. And so we can use that to understand the potential impacts of those species. Thanks, Quentin. Anyone, any of the speakers wants to jump in to answer to Penny's comment? Seems everyone's agrees. Everyone's agrees with you, Quentin. Um, I th I think it's Katja here. I think that's really interesting. Um, it just got me in thought a little bit about um, some things uh, that 
uh, we don't know yet be exciting to look at um, is where biases, we know about some of the implicit biases and occurrence records in natural history collection data um, uh, where people are collecting in particular ways, um, but we don't necessarily know those implicit biases on the specimen interaction data. Um, I do know that some collectors um, in natural history collections have been better about capturing interaction, biotic interaction data in the past, um, historically. And that the, the trend, um, a positive trend, I think, going future in the future is that people are more interested in when they're collecting to capture richer data about the organism at the time that the specimen is collected. And um, uh, so, so that would be a really um, uh, some line of avenue, of really something interesting to, to look at um, further. And it looks like Yort's got his hand raised. Maybe it's about the same question. Okay, is Yort and then Dimitri. So Yort, please. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to add to what uh, Katja and Quinton already have said, uh, that it's very important to look beyond just your own discipline or your own locale to uh, when thinking about species interaction data, just to give an example of how, how much species interaction data is there, but it's not currently being indexed. Uh, in an exchange I've had, actually it started at Thadwick uh, a couple of years ago with uh, Scott Bates. And he, um, he, he runs this project called Mycoportal. And he was talking about this uh, fungi interactions and Years later, he, you know, he sort of, uh, he was able to share this data and now all of a sudden there's 1.2 million interaction records added to the Kobe index. So that just told me how much patience we need to have and how much, uh, yeah, with adding and uh, this, discovering this data that's already there and just to also be, uh, yeah, be, uh, be aware of all these untapped resources that are just waiting in drawers and hard disks and laptops that are just waiting to be used. So that's just what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, Jorin. We have Dimitri, who's next. Hi, uh, hello everyone. It's great to be at the Talbik even the virtual. So nice to see so many familiar faces. And I have a comment on this interaction business and also on the botanical gardens. Um, from experience, if you expose a species to something weird like new hosts or new conditions, you basically, you don't capture their natural interactions. You, you capture their physiological limits at least in the insect fungus interaction studies, you can feed them all sorts of weird stuff in the lab, which they will never even fly by in the wild. So, I mean, depends what you want to capture, but I mean, it's, it's very nice to see what can happen in the botanical gardens and the zoos, but I don't think it has to do with uh, natural interaction so much. But uh, I, fully, I fully support the points uh, made by Katya and Jorit. Uh, that uh, the potential for capturing interactions is huge. And uh, people, many people would actually happily collect the interaction data if they only would know how. So in my experience, I, I basically try to teach entomologists how to capture fungal information and teach mycologists to be entomologists a little bit. And people, people are eager to learn, but there are not many ways to see how how to do that, how to capture this in, uh, information right. If you if you finish entomology department, they will not teach you how to record fungal information and vice versa. Even if you try to Google it now, just when the session is over, you try to Google like how to capture insect fungus interactions data. I don't think you'll find many helpful guidance. And so it's like, actually the information is not so easily available. I don't know how, how we can help this business. I'm raising my hand. Uh, someone said something. This someone is said... it, it, it's Deb. I'm raising my hand. Can I? Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Deb. We are already uh, on time, but oh. we will let you speak. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say um, we need more examples. I put one in the chat um, 
of a call for what we need to do that was come from the ecology community um, to sort of explain some of these things about what do we do to get people to collect data that has what we need in it for the future. Um, and there were two other examples I can think of, and I'd love to hear more from people. One is uh, at the Denver Botanic Gardens where they got ecologists and collectors to work together to collect for each other. And they did a lot of work in advance of that to talk about what would make more data more useful for the other party when they go out and collect, what would they need to voucher and what would they need to collect to make it more useful. Um, and they published that, I can dig that up for you. And another thing we did was at an Ecological Society of America meeting, take the ecologist out and voucher uh, and actually walk them through the process from field to database. Um, anyway, those are some ideas and would love to hear more. Thank you, Deb. I will officially close the session by uh, thanking first all our speakers and of course all attendees. It has been a great participation from, from everyone. I'm very happy for that. Uh, let me remind you that this session has been recorded for later viewing, so it will be made available um, at a later date. And also let me ask you to stay tuned for the next sessions for this Stadwick virtual conference. So today we have a 20 UTC symposium number six, that is, you've got what in your collection? So that one is going to be also a very interesting set of set of talks and discussion. And then we have today also the social session one at 23 UTC. So you're all invited to stay with us at this virtual conference. Thank you very much to everyone and hope to see you soon in the next talks. Thank you.